Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange for all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief. I'm your host, Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Oseman. I'm your advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my wonderful co-host, Hey, Kiana how's Holliday. it going? Sorry, Chief. We we thought we lost you for a second, Good. so I'm we started saying hello without you. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. I'm here at Fort Moore, uh, formerly Fort Benning, uh, out here in Columbus, Georgia. And uh, I thought I was getting away from the Texas heat, but uh, it's it's just as hot here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But uh, yeah, without further ado, Kiana, please, we have a wonderful guest today. And so please introduce today's guest. So today's guest is a singer songwriter whose music shows empathy for those around her. She's a strong advocate for social issues and her songs often fueled by her observance about others' struggles. She was a new folk finalist at the 2020 Kerrville Folk Festival and her music is described as Americana grit and soul. Please give a warm chief chat welcome to Anne E. Deshant. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. It, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, can you let our viewers know where you're joining us from? I am in uh, a campground in North Dakota by Roosevelt Park. I'm on my way out to Montana. Totally um, relaxed. Like, I'm on sabbatical right now, so I'm on vacation. My first big summer vacation in a while. So, yeah, we're coming to you from a park where it's, I, to me, it's awesome because I'm not used to it, but they're like horses. People can keep their horses here at their campground. So, and I'm in my, I'm inside Vanny Bryce right now, our, our camper van. No, speaking of Vanny Bryce, can you tell us more about your travels? Uh, yeah, so we, um, I live in Canada now, and then we started in, Ohio, where uh, Vanny is kept, and uh, we've just been driving. And yesterday, we we like were on I ninety four, and we saw the Badlands. You know, just it's like boom, and there they are. And so that's been a really wonderful part. Like we took a hike yesterday, and as we came up out of the Painted Canyon, um, there was a storm coming in. So there was this beautiful light, like the painted sky. And then to the left of it, you could see the, this band of rain um, also coming in. So it was just like, we felt so lucky, fortunate to be there at that time with that light coming in and the variance of weather. And then just to like see the Badlands for the first time in my life. It's just incredible. And we're headed to Glacier Park in Montana. So fishing will commence soon. Oh, very nice. That's awesome. That sounds like a really good time and a lot cooler than Dallas, Texas right now. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> wanted to take it back to the beginning of your career. Um, so what or who inspired um, you to become a musician and a songwriter? Well, um, different things. As far as singing, it was something that I could, um, I just could access naturally. That was just given. Not to say that I haven't worked on it, um, because I have, but I would go back to uh, my grade school in Ohio. Uh, I grew up in a small town, and I remember being in, I think I was in sixth grade at the time, and Laureen Coughlin, who was the choir teacher, came in to kind of, she was fielding the class, I think, to find people for the choir. And um, I rem she pulled me aside afterward and said, Annie, you have a beautiful voice. I think you should join. That was really the beginning of a structured uh, musical experience, like as me recognizing myself as a singer. I'd always sung, and I know my my parents could see early on. I mean, they got me a guitar and lessons because it was 
clear. But I would really credit Lori Coughlin, who's still the choir teacher at St. Joseph's School in Avon Lake, Ohio. Um, and I got to see her recently because I did a presentation for the children there. I did the, a school presentation on songwriting and what I do. But she really was the first person to, in a more formal way, see me uh, and hear me. And then, and God bless her for like pulling me aside because I'm not sure I would have, I'm not sure I would have joined the choir um, had it not been for her. So yeah, she kind of like set me on that path. So I'm grateful to her. That's awesome. And I, and I don't know if Kiana or Emily know that I was once in the choir in, in uh, <laughs> first grade. <laughs> I, I quickly grew out of my singing voice. I, I don't know. I hit, I probably hit about 10 years old and my voice just went down here from there. So really, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened. It was puberty. I don't know what it was. And I did play the recorder, but I think everybody in the school played recorder. Uh, it, so it, it didn't, it didn't set me apart from anybody. <laughs> and I guess, for but, uh, you, can you song, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say about songwriting. I didn't know it was a thing. Like, um, you know, I was in a small town. It wasn't like we were in a major music center and I don't think it occurred to me, like, this is something you can do like as a career. Um, and, but I always had, I felt like I always had something to say or something that I wanted to express that way. But um, there wasn't sort of like this structure there to say, oh, you can write. And I've done uh, workshops in my hometown and it is amazing still that it's not a ubiquitous, you know, it's not like it's out there like it is in Nashville. Like everybody and their brother is a songwriter there. And those children grow up in a school that it's a choice, like it's a clear choice. So I would just say quite naturally, I felt like I needed to say something. And then of course I saw Coal Miner's Daughter in ninth grade. And then I was like, oh, like Loretta Lynn sitting in her garden, she's digging and, and she realizes, oh, I'm a songwriter. Like it's a thing. So you sort of come to it. I came to it more organically than anything. Um, so yeah. And then of course I moved to Nashville after my career was well in place in Cleveland, Ohio area. Um, and I moved to Nashville to become a more serious writer for other people and myself. Yeah. So, so when you, when you were writing, I mean, did you always have a, a like a passion for writing like journaling or just, uh, I don't know, or just, did you always express through music uh, per, per se? It was always music. Like I didn't keep a journal as a child. Um, I could write like in school. Um, writing came to me like, I always wished math would come to me. Like some of my friends who could just <laughs> sort of had a knack, you know, like, and I never did. Like it, it was downhill and math and chemistry, but but writing was always a thing that I was like, oh yeah, I have to write a paper on this book, you know, I'll quiet on the Western front, I can do that. Um, you kind of take for granted, right? The things that you're good at, you think like that's not special cause you could do it. So I could write, but it was always in song that I express myself. I, it's just a feeling, certainly just the melody that is into me and I can, I can feel it. And I, I've said to people before, I could sing and express feelings that I couldn't say, like I couldn't talk them out, but I could mm -hmm. sing them out. And I think I needed to. Awesome. Awesome. So can we, can you tell us about your, your band Odd Girl Out? And uh, it was real popular in the Ohio region in the nineties. And uh, what, what made you decide to go solo? Well, um, we were really, we were really successful, like things came fast and it was just like one of those things where it was great timing, but we were a really good band. It was fronted by three women. We had wonderful harmonies, great guitarists, just the kind of talent that you need to fill in all the gaps for a band. And it was just at the time of like Lilith Fair had started. A lot of women artists had started to come more into the forefront um as writers also not um 
writers and singers and leaders of bands. So yeah, we hit at the right time. Like we were the first band on the cover of Cleveland Magazine. And then we just, you know, I don't think there was anybody that we met who knew kind of what to do with us, um, where we were. And I, and at that time, I think we had some opportunities. Uh, we went to New York, we were at the power station, but it, it didn't work for, for reasons, you know, that I'm not going to go into, not with, as far as the band, but as far as the band, it, it started to get stale. I thought that we were getting lazy. Um, and not writing as much. I started actually to write more then um, because our primary writer wasn't me at first. And then I started to write more and I felt like we were kind of slacking. And then there was um, an altercation and I just decided I, ca I can't be here anymore. It, it became toxic and, I, and it was a big leap, believe me, because we were, a really well-known band, but I think I, what I learned about myself in that struggle, and it was a struggle, it was hard, was that I had the ability and the courage to walk away. To I think we're always taught to say yes, like yes is a good thing, but sometimes no is a, is a good thing. And um, it's scary because we don't learn it in our culture, or at least in my culture, I'll speak for myself, but I... I did teach myself in that, that I'm brave enough to say, this doesn't feel good to me and I'm not going to do it. And I got to take a chance and let the chips fall. Yeah. I, well, I, was, I was talking to my, my saying yeah to things, family, whatever the case may be. And I saw something on the internet where it says, every time you say, yes, you're, you're in, you are accepting everything that comes with that. Yes, all the problems, all the drama, whatever, whatever's coming in from whoever you're you're saying yes to. You're you're saying that yeah, I can handle that, and so you have to think about that before you say yes. It that is a great way to think about it. Yeah. So someone once described your music as songs with a conscience. So you tend to root for the underdog. So what were the roots of that empathy? I grew up in a um, middle class town. We, like my brother and, and sister and I, before my f the fourth child was born, my littlest sister, we shared a room. We never felt like we lacked for anything. I mean, we were fed and clothed and I had a nice education. But I think it's that my dad worked at BF Goodrich. My mom worked for our family doctor in his office. and. I knew everybody in my town and I think that rooted me in human connection. I think that my sister, my older sister, Amy taught me empathy really early on. Like she could, we would be in a family situation and she would say, Annie, you know, I had a, a kind of wicked temper. I was fast to, to be angry. I was very passionate. And, um, but she could pull me aside and say, here's how mommy feels. Here's how dad feels. Here's how Robbie feels. She could explain in the family, everybody's position psychologically and emotionally. I think she taught me empathy and, and a writer's really a writer's most, um, outstanding characteristic is perception. Like you're, you're sort of like walking around the world and you're listening to everything and you're trying to see how everybody connects. And I think that's that lesson in empathy from my sister all the time, those lessons and the connectedness that a person who writes normally, that person you're watching just makes me, I think if you understand and you know people and you can write about them because you, you can write about them and you write what you know. And I think that's what I know. And usually it's not a, everybody's suffering, everybody's struggling, everybody has joy at a certain point. Um, and so you find those struggles and joys where you, where you grow. And that's what I did. That's awesome. So um, you, your song Green Hand, 
which dates back to the Odd Girl Out days, is about welcoming troops home, a subject line that's close to the heart of Exchange Associates. Um, what was the inspiration behind the song? At the time I wrote it, there was a lot going on regarding soldiers. Like I think Born on the 4th of July was released in a different, you know, look at what it is that soldiers, many of them face when they, when they come home. Um, and so, oh yeah. <laughs> I look great in those false eyelashes. Um, so I, I kind of, I have to tell you that sometimes I feel self-conscious about that song because it is, it's not really a happy song. It's not a happy song about soldiers. And I know that all soldiers aren't this story, but I also know that some are. I think later on in my writing, I learned how to build in some sort of redemption in my songs. So now in my songs, when I write them, even if it's a sad story, I, I look for that glimmer of hope to add in to it. But it's what I learned at the time. And, you know, you you were starting to he see films that weren't like Patton, you know, or um, all the films that we grew up with when I was younger, like which really was always winning, always a positive kind of slant on it. But I also grew up with, you know, the show MASH and even you know, so I started to see a different side of of war and, and struggle. And like I said, sometimes I, I feel like I wish I would have put something, a glimmer of hope in it. Um, but I mean, I remember going to Washington and setting cassette tapes of that song on the Vietnam wall, by the wall or by the monument um, to share with people. And, and it was accepted by some um like Rolling Thunder, the motorcycle group that rolls through the country, asked me to like, be part of their one of their events. They asked me to ride on the motorcycle, but I had something to do that morning, so I didn't get to go on the ride. <laughs> I was like, "Darn it!" But, but I knew, I knew the reason I'm saying that is because I knew that it connected with somebody, you know, um, that it was an authentic expression. Um, yeah. Okay, good stuff. And uh, you also address topics such as gender equality in your song, Girls in Airplanes. So uh, what was the inspiration behind that song? And uh, how'd you feel like, how'd you how'd you feel when it was featured on uh, the Brooke Shield and Wanda Sykes uh, movie, Hot Flashes? I couldn't believe it. I got this call on a Monday morning and this guy's like, it's Brad and I'm making a movie and your song, I'm choosing it. And, you know, I mean, I was like, what? Uh, like it did feel like it just sort of like came out of nowhere. There's me with Wanda at the after party. Um, yeah, it, it was so exciting. And then I, like I got to watch the film is um, with like Brooke Shields was sitting in front of me in the theater and we were watching the film. And like during the movie, it's like she makes this basket and then it's like, you know, the song starts. And I wasn't even gonna go like, to Hollywood, like, and I was like, I'm not going, I'm going to spend all the money I made on it to go. And this woman, um, Shirley in Nashville, Hutchins, she was like, Amy, you go down there, you get your picture taken, or what do they say, picture made with all those people, this is a chance, you get on that plane. And <laughs> I got on the plane and went to LA. Um, and I'm so glad she was wise enough to wrestle me in, and, you know, set me straight up. Uh, you know what the song i remember being in like i was in this like apartment in rocky river ohio down by the river it, where i lived i rented a little place and um i just remember like seeing that iconic picture you know of rosie the riveter and i was like i don't think i know enough about this woman and i should so i looked it up and i i found out all about the women who built ships and made munitions um and then I started to focus on the flyers, the women who flew and just their passion more than anything, it, their passion was for flying. They just loved to fly. And a lot of them already flew before they showed up in Texas. 
<laughs> at Love Field is where they were trained. I wonder how hot it was that day. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like 1,300 of them gathered and and they were so good at what they did. Like they found like they're every bit as tough as the men and as capable. And if you listen to some of the t reels of them talking about um, the way that they did things, the way that they learned, they never were paid. They were all volunteers. Um, I mean, like one of them went up in a plane once and somebody had put it together backwards. So all the controls were opposite. So she had to keep flying around while she figured out, how am I gonna land this thing opposite of everything I know? And so she just kept flying around until she figured it out and landed. Like that's how capable these women were. Um, I've listened to lots of uh, audio footage from those women and like, they're just badasses and um, they're wonderful. And I don't know how you couldn't be inspired by women who just, they wanted to be up in the sky, you know, and they wanted to like see a different kind of life. Like what were your choices back then? You could be a teacher or a nurse, you know, and although those are great professions, they don't cover everybody. Right. And so these, I think they just saw this chance, you know, to, to leave home and to see the open sky. So No, I love that. And, and speaking on empowerment, Pride Month is coming to a close and you are someone who is definitely interested in being an ally to the LGBTQ plus community. So can you touch a little bit on your influence, or not influence, but your advocacy rather for the LGBTQ plus community, especially in your music? Well, they are my community um, that I grew up with and came up with um, and out with. Um, and so I think my inspiration is the same inspiration that causes me to write and sing about everything I do, which is justice and equal ground for everybody, everybody, um, to have the fruits of life um, available to you uh, no matter what. Uh, and I, I recently told a father who was telling me that he had um, a a child that was transgender and he said, boy, when she told me, you know, I just said, you know, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be really hard. And I said to him, Nick, there's nothing harder than not being yourself. There's nothing harder than that. And uh, I think that's a lesson that I learned in my life. And then I think it's important, like some people wonder like, why do you have to march and have a parade? But I think those are people that don't understand how isolating being different can be and how a supportive community, I mean, we all have to have a community. That's the, that's really the number one thing that keeps us happy and feeling upright. And um, so that's how I feel about pride is that it, it, being gay or transgender doesn't make you it doesn't say anything more about who you are than your sexuality like it's like me saying i have hazel eyes so you should know a bunch of stuff about me that's absolutely not true but it does mean that you're going to face things that some other people won't in their lives and that like everybody you need support and if you need a parade and a month every year to remind you that you're supported then March on. So interviewers um, tend to focus on the strong lyrics to your songs. Um, and there's an alchemy in the music that makes the lyrics come to life. What's the music writing part of your process like? Painful. <laughs> it's hard. Oh, no. <laughs> it, it's, it's. You know, like, a, I think like when you're done and when you've got your record or you, you just, when you're done with a song, like all pain is forgotten. I think it's like giving birth. Like <laughs> my mom used to say, I'm like, mom, did it hurt to have us? She's like, you forget all about it when it's over. And I think that might be true <laughs> about songwriting. It's daunting and you got to show up like really open 
to the song and to yourself and it it's work and thank you for mentioning the lyrics you you guys have great questions i mean this is thank you for asking really good questions um but uh it the lyrics are the toughest part so i'm it makes me happy to hear that um you know, you mentioned that, that the lyrics are something people notice because that's the hardest part. Melody's not so hard for me. My process is I have to listen. Like I gotta be doing what I'm doing right now. Like I'm on vacation. I'm just soaking stuff in without any thought of, like you all broke the sabbatical. You you uh, busted the gate open and got me in front, <laughs> in front of the camera again, but I'm really- Appreciate it. it. Oh my gosh, no, I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's taking a break because I, I describe it like a sponge, like I'm, we're like sponges and sometimes all the water gets squeezed out and then we got to like have a time period where we soak it up all again so we got something to, to squeeze out, you know, and um, so I'm at that stage right now and then when it comes time, I'm like bursting with thoughts and to share and then... I, in Nashville, mostly they write the lyrics first and then you like, like, okay, now let's put it to music. But when I write by myself more than not, I might, I always start with an idea and I usually have a story already figured out. Like, I'm like, this is the story I want to tell. And I like to pick up a guitar and start, but I think there's something to be said for, you know, doing those lyrics first. So it, it could go any way, you know, I'll let it go the way it wants to go. Cause uh, like the girls in airplanes, we talked about that was all like, pick up the guitar, never shut up, never give in, <laughs> never gonna keep my feet on the ground again. Like that was like the start of it. And I just knew like, tick, 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 like I had something, you know? Um, so mm -hmm. had it not been for me picking up the guitar, I might not have got to that, just writing lyrics. So it's all different, but it's always like you got to have that, you know, kind of fallow period where you're not doing anything but watching movies, reading books, listening to people talk, looking at the beautiful Badlands, you know, seeing that storm sweep across and the painted sky. Uh, you got to have that, you know. No, and we talked a little bit about your influence just being in Nashville, but how has Nashville kind of influenced your evolution as a singer and songwriter? Nashville made me like economy of words, like Nashville made me buckle down and get to the point creatively, but more quickly. Like I went there to write for the market. So as soon as you say you're going to write for the market, now you got some rules in place, right? You're not going to have a song that's over three and a half minutes and they're getting shorter and shorter. But I think like sitting with Ralph Murphy, God bless his soul at ASCAP, he used to let me come in his office and sit with him and hand him my lyrics and we play the song and, you know, Nashville and him and others taught me economy of words, get rid of the fat on songs, make the story clear to your listener. Um, it's a linear conversation, right? Between two people. It's all coming from me to your ears and I got to make it make sense, but I got to make you feel. So I have to make you, it makes sense for you, for you and, and make you feel that's my job. So I think they taught me to be more succinct, but for a while they really knocked me for a loop. I mean, I was a mess and I was writing really crappy stuff, um, really. And, but I had to like start on this circle and go around, learn, 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 pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up more and more and more, and then come back to myself. Um, Cause myself is where it all started. And I think that's what makes you best is when you're at your, your best yourself. But you also, you know, you gotta pick up some stuff from people when you endeavor to write for a market that's pretty specific. Now that's not to say like, once you learn all that stuff, then you got to insert your own thing. Cause if I don't do that, what am I bringing? Right. I got to bring what I can. And I did go there with something. I think um, that was unique. If you're, if you're writing yourself, then you are, it's impossible that you wouldn't right? be unique. 
but uh, you got to get to that. And in spite of all the rules and all the stuff they're throwing at you, and there's a lot being thrown at you, you got to start learning how to say, I'm not listening to that. I'm not listening to that, but that makes sense to mm. me. So that's what Nashville kind of te teaches you to do is they're going to tell you what to do, but you got to figure out what you're going to do. Nashville probably about a month and a half, two months ago. And uh, from that brief, uh, that tennis that, uh, of the young lady that you said told you to go see the movie premiere, you were spot on because they, they, they had the most drawn out draw that I've ever experienced uh, in life. And so uh, thank you for giving us that little uh, bit, of, bit of Tennessee here uh, a, few, a few questions ago. You're welcome. <laughs> so we've been talking about your music. We, we've been talking music. Uh, so let's let's say, who do you listen to, uh, and what what's in your iPod or or play whatever it be? Uh, okay. Well, I first of all, I love Mary Chapin Carpenter. That that never goes away. Um, I listen to like Guy Clark. I was introduced when I was in Nashville. I love his writing. I've been getting into. Um, some John Prine. Um, sometimes I listen to some of the newer artists to see what they're up to. I think some of the newer females are getting a little tougher. Like they're not just all about drinking wine and looking good without any makeup. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm like, do we do more than that? I think we do. Um, and so I'm starting to see some of that happen. Um, Oh, you know, with the passing of um, Gordon Lightfoot, I started to like listen to some of him and like try to learn uh, one of his songs. Like there's nothing like learning somebody's song to figure out like how great they are or not. Mm -hmm. But boy, mm -hmm. he is really something. But I love Mary Chapin Carpenter. Um, I think she's a great and I think she's sort of underrated, too. Um, like I think she's as good as a lot of the people who get a lot of attention. Um uh, who else am I listening to? Uh, I don't, let me think. I'm trying to think of like somebody who like early on, well, of course, like Loretta Lynn was a huge influence, um, on me early on. Cause it was down, you know, it was like rooted in something that I was familiar with and very like plain spoken, but so poignant. Like she's so like, she says the work we done was hard at night. We'd sleep cause we were tired. I'm like, it sounds like so simple, but it's it's actually brilliant. <laughs> so yeah. I love yeah, things exactly. like that. Yeah. I love John Prine's hello in there about talking to people as you pass them on the street. They're older. Nobody's probably talking to him. And he's like, say hello. Hello in there. I just, things like that set me off my feet, you know. Um, so that's what I'm listening to. I will tell you that early on, not so much now. But um, whenever there's like a big deal, I'm like, why are they a big deal? Like, why why is this person so popular? So I started to like tune into um, a little bit of um, Kanye and and like Beyonce because you really can't walk down the street without hearing those names. But I like her early stuff, like to the left, to the left, and <laughs> put a ring on it. I, mean, I, <laughs> I thought that was brilliant, and, and boy. What a voice. Um, and I, you know who else I like? And I don't care what anybody thinks, but I love that Justin Bieber. I, I, cause he changes all the time and he's able to like morph and do, you know, do these like pivots that I love. I, and he's having fun. Like I always think like I look at him and like that kid's having the best time. You know, I hope he gets through this illness that he has now. But it's a myriad of people that I listen to. Um, my my friend Pete, who's a great guitarist, he introduced me to Rosetta Tharp a few years ago. And I was like, holy crap, like, you didn't know there's a woman with this electric guitar, like, killing it before Nancy Wilson, right? Like, you know what you know until somebody's like, hey, look back 50 years, you know, and see the building blocks of all this. So I listen to a lot, a little bit of everything. I, I think you probably should. It's good. It's good. 
Um, no, that's awesome. And um, what's really cool, the way you can learn about uh, more music and um, artists that are maybe not as well known and not plastered in your face is social media. That's where I've discovered a lot of um, unknown or up and coming is social media. And speaking of social media, um, where can <laughs> we find out more about you and your work and what you're up to? Well, the best way is to go to AnnieDeshant.com, um, A-N-N-E-E. -E. Oh, there you, I think you might have it. Yeah, all those things. Um, and then if you go to my <laughs> Facebook, <laughs> if you go to my Facebook page, you can go to the Dream Makers and you can become a Dream Maker. It's like um, a group I created that I communicate most with. Um, it, we During the pandemic, we did all kinds of like activities like we did foodie Friday and we taste tested like candy bars and our favorite um, ice cream bars. <laughs> that was really fun. But the dream makers you can join, you just have to agree to some rules. Like it's not political at all. You're not allowed to name call, no, no nastiness at all. And uh, so the dream makers, you can go there. Um, but I would say for all the artists who are independent artists, like I am, the best way to buy our music is right from us, from our website. Cause uh, Spotify, mm -hmm. You're gonna get point oh 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 one point seven cents. <laughs> I don't know for everything we do. I just lost my lights. But um, anyway, um, yeah, that's how you reach me. And thank thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And uh, for our chief chat viewers, you can kind of view this episode as well as past chief chat episodes. Uh, but make sure you tune in at eleven a.m. Central on J July eleventh. When I guess will be Operation Desert Storm veteran Christine Walker, editor in chief of At Ease Veterans Magazine, and at 1 p.m. Central on July 20th, our guest will be actor Miles Teller from Top Gun Maverick, Whiplash, and more. So we appreciate you for for sharing a little time with us and taking a break break from your sabbatical on Chief Chat. So I feel I feel even more special and honored uh, <laughs> by you by you doing that. We we were able to get you off the lake or. Or, or out sightseeing or taking pictures to, to talk to us for the past 30 something minutes. So thank you. Oh my gosh, it's my pleasure, Kiana, Emily. Thank you so much, Chief. Uh, what a pleasure to be with all of you. And I'm really excited for what you're doing. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, if you don't mind hanging out with us until, until after the live, can so formal goodbyes. But I just want to say, uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for making songs for the underdogs because the underdogs uh, need a voice as well. And so just keep keep rooting and, and, and giving, uh, you know, empower uh, the folks that feel like they don't have, have a voice. So thank you. For that. And we wish all the band many blessings to you and, and your family. And uh, we'll we'll hang on after, uh, after the, the, the live stream and then uh, we'll we'll say our goodbyes. But thank you so much. And uh, Chief Chat out.